represents personality versus status symbol. For example, you're never going to see uh, uh, a prominent logo on our designs, as you do with, uh, with many, uh, many designer brands. It's subtle. Um, understatement versus ostentation, elegance versus fashion, warmth versus cold, quality versus trends, comfort versus look, day versus night, color versus black. Okay, we're Americans, and, and black is a, is a very urban, American element, but um, you know, when I started with Laura Piana, I vividly remember Sergio Laura Piana um, saying, "Black is not a color. <laughs> don't. We don't do it. Black is for funerals in Italy." Uh, he said, "You know, we're about warmth. We're about daytime. We're about fun. We're not about black." Um, some of the attributes of the Laura Piana brand, certainly uncompromising quality. And as I said earlier, that's true regardless of, of cost or regardless of price. Um, Italian lifestyle, 100% made in Italy. There are very few companies that are still doing that. Um, I'm hard pressed to name one other that's still doing that, honestly. You know, there's, uh, in our industry, are you familiar with Xenia, the brand Xenia? I'm not here to knock any other brand, but Xenia is, is probably the closest to Laura Piana in terms of the vertical integration. Xenia as well has their own bills and, and kind, of, kind of grew up the same way that, that Laura Piana grew up. Xenia made a choice to position itself very differently in the market and, for example, make a lot of their shirts in Mexico. Now. Again, it's not, nothing wrong with it, it's just a, a different choice and a different, uh, a different position. Um, Customer profile, <coughs> men and women age 30 plus and their children. It's a quality conscious, uh, quality conscious client, appreciative of timeless elegance, high net worth, professionally and socially <coughs> active, frequent international travelers, business and or leisure, and passionate about lifestyle sports such as golfing, sailing, polo, horse riding, hunting, classic cars, <coughs> which basically describes the War of Down family. Again, they essentially designed the brand for themselves and their friends. So positioning. This is a, uh, a pyramid that was done by Bain and Company a couple of years ago. It's a consulting group. It's not something that Laura Piana did. Um, but you've got absolute, aspirational, and accessible luxury there in the pyramid. Who can, uh, who can give me a definition of acceptable? You actually have, have it there, so I'm not... Uh, Asking you something too difficult. Accessible luxury means what? <coughs> Anyone? Is anybody listening to me? <laughs> Say it. Affordable. Yeah. It's affordable. You can have it. Why do you think? Um, why do you think a Tiffany and Company is uh, is there in the accessible? Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a valid point. Sorry, what were you gonna say? Oh, I was just agreeing with her. They have things that are at very high price points, but they also have more more accessible price points. Yeah. And depending on which Tiffany's you go into, you you'll you'll see more of one and less of the other. Yeah. For some of their rings, like they're expensive, they have like payment plans. Like, yeah. It's a it's a it's it's a different <laughs> positioning, absolutely. And I think you know Tiffany's is a good example of. Of, of a brand, and again, I'm not here to knock any other brands. I'm, I'm not trying to do that, but it's a very different strategy than a Laura Piana has maintained, where to grow their business, they kind of reached down, offered much more sterling, offered lower price points to, uh, to expand uh, and be a little bit more mass or accessible to the, to the general population. Then you have this aspirational brand in the middle. Um, that level is uh, very common in the luxury goods uh, industry. And uh, you know, I was saying earlier, I think luxury goods is kind of a word that's become overused and uh, applied to a lot more things than, than luxury goods 10 or 15 years ago was. Um, but you know, these brands, uh, a Gucci, for example, a Fendi, which I worked for for 15 years before I joined, I joined Laura Piana, and it's a world I know very well. Um, you know, a big chunk of that business is uh, that woman who saves her money to buy that one new Fendi handbag every season. That's, that's the aspirational 
luxury climate. Um, and then you have the absolute luxury at the top. And you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very easy to, to move down that, slide down that pyramid. It's not so easy to try to knock your way back up it. And you know, I don't know how much you're reading about what's, what's going on in, in the industry today, but you know, there are a lot of brands, Coach, that's trying to get away from a logo-driven business and sell more leather and go back to its core, is trying to, to eat it up there. And it's very hard to do, and it has hit them very hard financially. It was easy for them to slide down, go left, leather to canvas. You could say the same thing about Gucci. Gucci as a brand is trying to get away from the logo-driven business, trying to go back to the artisanal roots of Gucci and the leather goods, and it's not easy. It's not easy to move, your, move yourself back up there. Absolute luxury at the top. There are very few brands that have stayed focused at the absolute luxury level that are really large scale brands like Allure of Ghana. There's Allure of Ghana. There certainly is Hermes. Um, Chanel probably is another example. Honestly, I'm hard pressed to go much beyond that. Jewelers, Van Cleef I think is up there, Harry Winston, those kind of jewelers that have stayed with, with graph, you know, with, with true uh, uh, precious jewelry. There's elements of absolute luxury at Louis Vuitton. There's absolutely elements of absolute luxury at Tiffany. Um, but the brand as a whole has not stayed focused on absolute luxury the way that Lorpiana or Mez has. <coughs> So that's my Reader's Digest version of Laura Piana as, as a, in terms of a brand. Um, I think the key takeaways are the excellences, um, those things that we really have the complete vertical integration on. We sell cotton shirts. We sell silk shirts. We sell other, other materials. And we always source the best materials available. But the things that we have the vertical integration on are the cashmere, the baby cashmere, vicuna, lotus flower, merino wools, pecorinera. The gift of kings is the seventh one, which is, is another merino wool. Can I answer any questions for you guys? Anything that uh, you want to know about Lorquiana, want to know, uh, I don't know, about the industry? I have some helpers here who can help me ask que answer questions if I need it. Anyone? Yes? Okay, Beck, you just had that um, pyramid up there. Yeah. Well, Hermes has just started showing a collection in Paris Ooh, they, just go. this past week. Yeah. So they didn't do, really do that before. They're mm -hmm. actually showing in Fashion Week. So is that a step that Laura Piano will take in the future, that's pressured by the industry to have a collection that's shown at more fashion? That's, that's a good question, and one that actually leads to something that I probably should have talked about anyway, so thank you. Um, Laura Piana was purchased by LVMH about 14 months ago, the deal finalized. So it's, it's been a new gyration for those of us uh, that have worked there for a number of years. Um, and, you know, honestly, when, when we first heard about it, it was a little jarring, and some of us wondered, oh, God, this is such a, like, special, unique thing. Like, you know, are they, are they going to try to make it bigger? Are they going to try to move it down the pyramid? Are they going to what are they, they going to try to do? Um, so let me talk about that first, and then, and then I'll answer your question. Um, the, uh, the new ownership, uh, uh, there are no signs of... of changing the absolute positioning of the brand. And I think in the end, it's become very apparent that, uh, that Mr. Arnault, who, who runs LVMH, which is huge. I mean, on the fashion end of things, you're talking about Louis Vuitton, Marc Jacobs, Donna Karen, Kristen Dior, Bulgari jewelry. Uh, uh, I, could, I could go on and on. And there's a whole wines and spirits. It's a, it's a huge, uh, huge conglomerate. Um, but I think Mr. Arnault <laughs> really, really wanted to have that absolute, true, luxury jewel in his crown. And it's 
no big secret that he was trying to get her Hermes. <laughs> and I think that kind of got thwarted, and maybe Laura Piana was his consolation prize. I don't know, but he, he doesn't show any, uh, any signs of trying to, to move it anywhere. There certainly have been great things that have, have come out of uh, the new ownership in terms of just economies of scale that you gain on things like <coughs> medical benefits for the 200 Laura Piano employees in the U.S. versus the, I don't know, 7,000 LVMH employees or whatever it is. You know, those things got better. Our 401k actually got better. Uh, negotiating leases. I mean, if, if I'm negotiating a lease on the part of Laura Piana, I have some clout. I mean, there are some landlords that, yes, they really want to have Laura Piana, but if somebody from LVMH is negotiating on behalf of Louis Vuitton, Kristen Dior, Donna Karen, Fendi, it's kind of a different ballgame. So there's that, that element has, uh, uh, has and, and will have a strong impact. Our core businesses are clothing. Hermes core business, and now I'm finally getting back to your, to your question, really is leather goods. And Am I being recorded? You cannot distribute this anywhere. <laughs> I hate to say it, but look, I'm being a little sarcastic, but don't distribute it anywhere. But Laura Piana, <laughs> I hate to say it, is not selling a lot of handbags. And Hermes, I hate to say it, is not selling a lot of ready wear. And in actuality, it's the same client. Those people are buying their clothes with us and their leather and bags with, uh, with Hermes. So Hermes is, is trying to enter that arena in a bigger way. Um, certainly not in a way that's going to, going to bring them down a notch. I mean, I don't think they're uh, you know, reducing prices or trying to attract a more mass audience, but it is a way, I think, to address that lack in their business model and their growth. The reverse flip side of that is, I'm sure with the new ownership of LVMH, which has an immense amount of expertise in the leather goods area, I imagine we will start to have more of a focus on our bags as well. <coughs> but I don't know. I mean, I, uh, you know, you've got, uh, Chanel does a run of the show and does it fabulously, and, you know, they don't, they don't go to the market at all either. So I don't think it means that uh, they're going to change their position. I think they're trying to really grow that into the business in a prominent way. Hi. Hi. Um, being so far up this pyramid, to, to what extent can and do others ride on your coattails? I ask that from two points of view. One is when you sell your fabric to someone to do something with, do they, can they put Laura Piana, made the fabric, on what they make? You know, and, I, and the second part of the question is um, the horrible word knockoffs. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff. Because you're not logo driven, so is that less of a problem for you? It's not a problem at all for us. Because I really think amongst the general <coughs> population, Laura Piana doesn't mean very much. There's not really a lot of street value. H having come from a Fendi where knockoff was a, was a huge problem, I can talk very intelligently about that. But um, no, that, that piece is not a problem for us. In terms of uh, other people piggybacking on us, um, I don't know the specific requirements, but there are specific requirements in terms of who and when can use our label, and they get our consent. I mean, Armani, for example, there's a technical aspect to Laura Piana too. We developed something called Storm System with a membrane that you can you can Storm Systemize. Is that a word? You can you can treat cashmere with Storm System. You can treat Vicuna with Storm System, um, and we sell some Storm System fabrics to. Armani. Uh, and in that case, we let them put the label in. To Brooks Brothers, we let them put the label in. Um, help me, where else do we do you see our labels inside of clothes? Armani, Brooks Brothers, and I think that's it. For example, we don't let J. Crew do it. Uh, but it's, it's public knowledge, and I, I talk about it. But again, you know, there are very good views of cashmere, it certainly isn't baby cashmere. Um, it's, it's not as fine as cashmere we use in our own finished goods, and literally it's the threads we're selling them and they're weaving it somewhere else. All the way in the back. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a quick question. Um, more and more consumers are now shopping online, even for luxury goods. Do you think this trend will bring some changes to the business model? Um, and also I noticed that 
your website has a Chinese version, can you share some stories about your market expansion in China? You know, uh, China is a, is a relatively recent uh, endeavor for Laura Piana. I think it's only been in the last five years that we've had stores in China, period. Um, obviously, the Chinese consumer has, has become a much bigger piece of our business. And do you remember from the last World Report what the what the percentage of business globally was that uh, I just saw that number. I don't know, I want to say maybe it was 15% uh, uh, of the global business of Laura Piana is Chinese consumers, whether it's in China or it's a Chinese shopping in New York, um, something, something like that. And that kind of, I don't want to say it's come out of nowhere, but it's a number that certainly has, uh, has increased dramatically over the course of the last three or four or five years. At the very top of the luxury goods pyramid, because of a little bit of a downturn in the Chinese economy, because of the changes that the Chinese government made in terms of gift giving regulations and that sort of thing, at the very top, whether you're a Mez or you're a Piano, we've all felt a pullback from the Chinese uh, in the last 9 to 15, 18 months. Um, but uh, in terms of the, the digital um, uh, online consumer or shopper, yeah, I'm sure it will change. I mean, we launched, uh, I don't even remember when we launched our website, but uh, we launched eShop where you could actually shop on the website two, three years ago probably, right? Um, and you know what, it's now, um, it's about the same annual volume as we do in one of our smaller stores, Short Hills, New Jersey, for example. And you know what? You do that volume with two or three people. You don't have an investment in rent. You don't really, the way we run our e-shop, you don't even have, have an investment in inventory because it comes out of one of the boutiques. So it's, uh, it's really just a plus business. Um, if you're, if you're uh, a techie and, and into, into that stuff, we could talk about our website a lot because I happen to think that our website is beautiful in terms of storytelling. It's very difficult to shop on, <laughs> I think. Um, and probably could, uh, could have some improvements there. But I do think we, we do a good job of presenting the brand, I guess, uh, better, than, better than most. Hi. Do you have like a, a real marketing technique in a sense because you have such a small clientele? We um, have no marketing at Laura Piano. Right. And I'm, I'm really being fairly serious. Um, and that was really a tenet of, of Sergio Laura Piana's philosophy. Um, and when I first joined the brand, I had this moment where I was sort of like, I don't get it. Do they not want to spend the money? I, I don't know. It didn't, I couldn't make it make sense. Coming from a brand that did have such a big marketing vehicle behind it, and the ad pages and everything was such a, a critical part of the strategy. You know, Sergio Laura Piana uh, would, would say very vehemently, Laura Piana is not a brand that everybody should be able to see. It should not be in a magazine <laughs> for anyone and everyone. It is a very special product for very special targeted people. Uh, and really, that's the way the whole brand has been built. 20 years of finished goods, you uh, n almost never see a Laura Piana ad. Occasionally, we'll put uh, a full page in the Wall Street Journal to announce the record bail winner, the finest micron um, uh, merino wool fabric in Australia, New Zealand for that year. But it's that kind of ad. It's not a, a, a graphic fashion kind of ad. So, Wrong, right, we could talk about that for a, for a long time, but it's really the way that the brand has been built. And the ownership of LVMH, I kind of thought, oh, I wonder if that will shift. And now, actually, Bernardo Noe has been quoted numerous times saying how magical Laura Piana is because of the type of brand it is, the way it's been built, and the lack of, of really mass market. Um, he loves it, so I don't think that's going to change either. Thanks for your question. Anybody else? I saw the, the name on the, on the sales, that new sponsor. 
things like that? Oh yeah, there's a, there's a uh, there's a antique car team, there's an equestrian team. Uh, the Lorpion is own a boat, own a mega yacht that they race. Um, we've done very little of that in the U.S. More of that historically in Italy, where their family lives, and it's part of their lifestyle. And I do think that that sort of thing will happen more often. Now. Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. I'll be up front if you have any other questions. I'm happy to.